Okay. I think we should um, we should make a start. I'm sure others may uh, join us along the way. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this event, uh, an in-conversation event with uh, my guest, Ben Houchin, uh, who is the Mayor of Tees Valley. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Andrew. So I think the format is, um, I'm sure Ben's got some things that he wants to talk about. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about, get your views on uh, not only what's going on um, in your part of the world, mm -hmm. but also how you see the kind of broader agenda that you're part of, what would you want of it, you know, in the sense we know that there are things on the horizon in terms of the white paper and mm -hmm. you know, related activities. So it'd be good to get your kind of thoughts on, on that as well. And then um, we'll open it up for questions from you as well. So have a think about the kind of questions that you want to put to uh, Ben and we'll be done uh, by 4.30. So I suppose the first question, Ben, is um, enjoying being a mayor? Yeah, love it, <laughs> love it. Yeah, What's good absolutely. about it? Because you were a, you were a councillor in Stockton for you know six years is that right before uh, yeah so 2011 to 17 yeah, yeah, yeah. so you were kind of counselor good there. research Andrew uh, well you know you <laughs> always know who you're talking to <laughs> um, so you did that and then obviously mayority came along you mm. put your hat in the ring did you think you were going to win um, it depends on what time frame you talk about so I was involved quite heavily with James Wharton's re-election campaign in 2015 yeah um, thought about standing for Parliament decided not to it wasn't I didn't really think it was for me at the time um, but then devolution came about you know the whole northern powerhouse regional agenda with Cameron and Osborne and how you know fate would have it that uh, a couple of things happened one very negative thing one very positive thing the very negative being the closure of the steelworks in 2015 which created a uh, an issue that the government had to address obviously Heseltine came in and looked at the review of somewhere like Teesside in the local economy and the big positive um, post-2015 and his re-election was James Walton being the original Northern Powerhouse Minister who was charged with helping George deliver the devolution deals of which, and, and rightly so, given it was the very first deal, George very much concentrating on the Greater Manchester deal as the most complete deal. Yeah. And, and we had a, you know, it's a, an unsung champion, but a, um, a, a quiet story in that James Walton basically walked into George and said that he wanted a deal for the Tees Valley. Wasn't really much interest from Treasury or government no. in the Tees Valley at the time. And... He was said, you know, you can get yourself a deal if you can get the councils to work together and we'll support you, but we've got other bigger fish to fry, which, again, at the time, I suppose you can appreciate. And James ended up working with what were five Labour councils at the time to make it happen. So it kind of organically grew quite late in the day. I mean, it was always signposted, wasn't it, yeah, somewhere yeah, like Greater yeah, Manchester well, yeah, was going to get a deal yeah. for a long time. But the legislation wasn't passed until the December or maybe the November. Mm -hmm. um, so I was only selected as the candidate in December of 2016, so five months before the election. And I did it because, you know, I started running my own business, was a councillor, leader of the Conservative group at the time on Stockton Council. And I thought, well, if you ever want to be in politics, you can't pass up the chance for standing on what is quite an interesting platform in your own home patch. Yeah. And to be fair, I worked with James quite heavily and we said, well, look, we'll... We'll give it a go, we'll have a bit of fun, we'll give Labour a black eye, cause them a bit of a headache, yeah. and what will be, will be. So, to answer your question in that context, the day I was selected, no, I didn't think I was going to win. Um, I thought we'd give it a good go, and we'd cause a problem for the local Labour Party going up to the next general election. Right. Give them a few things to, call, to cause a headache, including the airport pledge, yeah. um, which is all kind of, one, to demonstrate what bears can do, but two, it's actually a fundamental problem, and a very parochial one, but a fundamental problem with infrastructure and connectivity in the Tees Valley. But as you got closer to the election, so come end of February, beginning of March time, there was, a very, there was an interesting sense that, hang on, things aren't how they usually go in elections in yeah. Teesside. Yeah. So uh, to signal my genuine thought that it was a possibility was when I was running my own business, I ended up having to come to an arrangement with my business partner to set up me exiting the business if I was to win. So we had that all in place. So the day I was elected, I actually signed the papers and handed the business over and exited that business because we had it set up because there was a possibility. And when you got to, when you got to a week before, I mean, in, in all honesty, from a political standpoint, it felt like we'd already won because either I run Labour as close as they've ever been run before yeah, on that yeah. type of election or yeah. we actually win. Yeah. And then walking into the count, um, it was a coin toss. It was, it, we, so we, we were pretty buoyant at the time, given where we were in, in that kind of cycle of Conservatives in, in the North East. And then the first round came out, which is something that's often missed in Teesside as part of the evolution of the Red Wall, etc. But we won the first round yeah. of that election. That was when we knew it was done, because in Teesside, it is still the case today, you either vote Labour 
or you vote for somebody who's going to beat Labour. Yeah. So the fact that Labour couldn't win round one meant it was impossible for them to win round two. And when you actually look, yeah. I won comfortably every single council on round two because we swept up the UKIP and the Lib Dem vote, who'd obviously voted for their candidates in round one. So, yeah, it, it evolved over time. But for those senior ministers who said some very choice things about the likelihood of me winning was impossible, <laughs> you know, it didn't feel like that on the ground. And we were trying to feed that back. But at the time, you know, you remember the context of where we were. It yeah. was an unlikely thing. But uh, no, I remember around the time uh, I'd been asked about that and sort of saying that, Nancy's value is a bit, firstly a bit of a dark horse in terms of getting itself into the devolution agenda because yeah. that wasn't really where yeah. Osborne was focusing. As no. you say, he was thinking about that, you know, the Northern Powerhouse as he was thinking about Absolutely. which meant those different places and yet his value came up. And then obviously, uh, particularly given uh, the politics at the time, the likelihood of a Conservative, yeah. you know, winning there was, uh, was a, a launch up. Um, what was it that the public told you that, why did they vote for you? What, what is it that you offered them that made them choose you? The what airport. They said to you? Is it the airport? It was the airport. I mean, why is the airport let's, so not, let's not overcomplicate it. No, no, there was no, no, no kind why? of complicated okay, so policy important? agenda that we cut through with. No, 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 quite. It was, it was, it was you know, you, you, you've got to think in Teesside, which is why it's a parochial issue, but it's so important, yeah. is that the success and failure or the natural decline of Teesside going back over the last 30 years with its peak and then its, its slight decline, strangely enough, follows the relative success and then the decline of the airport. So I'm very confident that there is a conscious and in some instances a subconscious link between the success of the area being linked with the success of the airport and people see those two things as one and the same. It's a bit like the local high street yeah. argument that we yeah. see with the town's fund at the minute. If you feel like your high street's full of shops and it looks like a nice place to be and you can go and spend some money and you can see independent shops, you feel like the area's on a bit on the up and the airport encapsulates that for Teesside. And if you go back to the early 2000s when it kind of peaked at a, just over a million passengers, then Peel came in and you just saw this gradual decline. That was kind of Teesside. I mean, the early 2000s, even up to kind of 26, uh, 2006, 2007, we didn't get the economic boom of the Blair years that other areas felt across um, parts of the country that uh, felt that economic boom. And, you actually look at the election outcomes that Labour have had since 1997, they've gone back at every single election, local and national, in Teesside since 2005, local, national and European. Yeah. So it was a gradual ebb away, and then you had all sorts of things like Brexit, you had a bit of UKIP as that kind of, people say that gateway drug into voting for somebody else other than what your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather voted for. And we thought that was going to be the tipping point in 2017, but it wasn't Brexit that made the, the break because that was still a UKIP angle. It wasn't anything else. It was the airport that just, I mean, and that's one of the reasons we ran it as well, because when we first came up with the policy, that was also a wedge issue that we were preparing for because we knew how important it was. It was a wedge issue for the, the election because if I wasn't going to win, we knew we were going to fight a mayoral election on me trying to save it and Labour basically saying it's a waste of money, it should close, yeah. which was going to cause Labour a problem because if I hadn't bought the airport, the airport would have closed by when the next election was due to be. Right. So we were planning three or four years ahead with that campaign. It just meant that, you know, I was walking into local housing estates, like places like Ingleby Barwick in, in Stockton that people wouldn't necessarily know. And we only spent 8,000 pounds on my whole campaign. Right. One leaflet that we were trying to hand deliver across the whole of the Tees Valley. And you were knocking on doors in Ingleby Barwick and people were naturally saying, I'm voting for the guy that's gonna save the airport. I mean, it sounds, speaking about it from anybody that's not from the area, a little bit weird, yeah. but you've got to come to Teesside to just understand how, and even now, I mean, it, I, I actually, I have been giving hints and tips to the Labour Party recently, just stop talking about the airport. For every time you say it's a waste of money and we shouldn't have it and there are more important things, you're just losing more votes. You just, right. just let it go. Just understand that that is something that people in Teesside want to see happen and let's have a conversation about other things that so are equally if, as important. Even if, you know, retrospectively now, it, it, well, where we are now, it didn't make sense, or the, the airport, you know, doesn't go the way that you would want. You, would, you are not forced, but you would be expected to deal with it rather than to say, I made a mistake. And we no, no, that, that, that's not quite right. Okay. So when, we, when, we, when I was elected, obviously, this is something that people often forget on the journey that we've been on in yeah. the Tees Valley, that, you know, we've done lots of successful things, but people forget for the first 18 months, it didn't matter what I did. Uh, and there was, you know, in the early days, we were just getting up and running, but we did lots of good stuff in the early days. Yeah. And I would stand on, you know, local TV, local radio, local gazette, and they'd be like, oh, that's great, Ben, but when are you buying the airport? Yeah. Okay. And the thing that changed everything for me, and this, this again, you, it sounds really weird, a room full of people who are not from Teesside, <laughs> well, trying, trying, to, trying so to help you understand the local parochial nature of, of this issue. 
But the, day, the thing that everything changed for Tees Valley was when we actually bought the airport, because one, it created a link with the electorate that had been severed for a long, long time, because there'd been lots of broken promises for years, both national and in local government, where we're gonna do X, and all these shiny pictures were produced, and everybody said, oh, this is great, and we're gonna invest X into whatever, and it never actually happened. And what you had was, which is I, was, I benefited from, there was a lack of cynicism, in my view, of, of them saying, oh, we're gonna back this guy who wants to buy the airport. Yeah. They kind of gave me the benefit of the doubt, yeah. And then when I bought it, it just changed the whole credit. It was credibility just changed completely because you got to a point where, and we still hear it now, they say, look, if Ben says he's going to do something, he does it. Yeah. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And there were very few in Teesside for a lot of years that have been able to say that. And that's all predicated on the airport. All of the work we're doing on the Freeport, the SSI, Redcar Steelworks redevelopment is going to take 15 years. It's a bit like the conversation that government are having at the minute about Northern Powers Rail leveling up. Yeah. It, you know, to change and do what we want to do is going to take 15, 20 years. But you've got to be able to do some quick wins that signpost people that you are making progress. People can't buy into a 10, 15, 20 year vision without seeing at least some progress. You give them progress yeah. though, and people are really willing to buy into yeah. it. That's the cynicism in politics at the minute, yeah. that there are so few that do what they say they're gonna do. You just give them, a, you just show a little bit of leg and people will go with you yeah. on it, and then it allows you the time to be able to develop the longer term plans. And presumably, as part of that kind of early wins, you're, you're having to identify, rightly identifying um, issues that have a, a symbolic nature. You know, you talked about the airport for one. Mm -hmm. Steelworks in the future of, obviously, is a massive issue in your part of the world as well. So even though it might take 15, 20 years, yeah. they are symbolic issues that people want to know that you're not ignoring them and trying to do something else because they are so important. Is that right? Yeah, it is. So again, the, the Teesworks site is, a, is a, an equally important one. It's a, what was originally a 25-year plan, I think we'll end up delivering it in somewhere between 10 and 12 years now with the progress that we're making. But you can't say to someone, right, we're going to create 20,000 jobs on this steelwork site in 25 years. Yeah. They can be like, oh, that's great, but your average person in the street is going to be like, yeah, I believe that when I see it. Yeah. So again, what we've had to do is we've had to signpost it. So, you know, we're doing a lot of communication with the public to show that the site's being cleared, demolition is happening, remediation's going on. You know, just last week we started construction, the first piece of construction after um, actually nearly 12 months of owning the site, but you know, six years since the SSI site closed yeah. in 2015. Yeah. You're now starting in the construction phase now. So people can start to, rather than demolition and clearance, you're now seeing building positive activity. So last week was that first step with the new heavy lift key that uh, it started construction last week. In four or five, maybe six weeks time if we're a bit slow, the new GE offshore wind factory is gonna start being built. So again, you move into another phase that there's a, I was even surprised a few weeks ago, I was speaking to some people in Redcar and there is a level of cynicism about, you know, a few people, a few people still saying they don't, you can tell they don't quite believe the GE thing's actually gonna happen. Yeah. And sometimes when you're so close to it because you're negotiating the deal and you're dealing with funders, et cetera, et cetera, you take it as a given, but you sometimes forget the public just see another headline in a piece of, on, a, on a paper. Whereas in five weeks, again, it's a bit like the airport, it'll change again. You'll see piles going in the ground, you'll see steel structures, steel beams going up for the construction of it. And again, that's gonna help us build even more credibility on another project that isn't the airport that says, actually, it's not finished yet. And yes, it's gonna take 20 hours, but the factory is being built, construction jobs are being created. These things are actually happening. Yeah, and one of the other projects, I, I, you know, from outside, as I've noticed you've talked quite a bit about, yeah, is about Darlington Station mm -hmm. and the connection, you know, A, improving the capacity of it, but actually therefore making the connections, yeah. you know, out to, out to parts outside of the region. Is, is that another kind of symbolic thing that resonates with people? And, you know, it has yeah. an importance, but it also resonates with the public. It, it, it has a reso I mean, it's, it resonates with people that don't even use trains. Yeah. And it's because it's a bit like the levelling up agenda. It's an investment in somewhere that has felt left behind for a long, long time. And it's just that feel good factor that we're no longer an afterthought. And, you know, five years ago, you know, I can tell you civil servants couldn't be able, couldn't have pointed to Teesside on a map. Whereas now civil servants are always asking us, what do you think? I mean, they're actually asking us, what do we think about various things? What do we think about leveling up? So things change very, very quickly. And it's the same on a local level. So people see that, you know, lots of people don't get the train, but they see an investment in Darlington as a positive move forward because it's money, it's the government caring. It's actually something bigger than Teesside actually happening here. And, it's a really important part of devolution. I know we've talked about in previous years, Andrew. It's a really important part of devolution. We talk about Darlington Station, but the people of Hartlepool and Redcar buy into the investment as well. Because yeah. we're all, you know, the, devol the devolved area is one, Teesside is one community. And so a, an, an investment in Darlington is an investment in the people of Redcar and, uh, and Hartlepool and everywhere in between. But also you've got to be frank with people and explain why. I mean, in investing in Darlington Station is great for Darlington. It'll be revitalized the local area. But it also means you can get 
up to seven trains an hour on the local line instead of just two at the minute because of the impact on the rail alignment issues. So people can say, well, it's great having a shiny building, but actually it means for me in Middlesbrough. So I've had people in Redcar, nurses in Redcar, who work at James Cook, message me on social media and say, this is amazing because it means that now I, I find it extremely difficult to get to work and I can just jump on a train in, in a couple of months' time when TPE extended their um, service to Redcar and I can now go to work really easily. It saves me a fortune. I don't drive. And it's those little things. And that's, people can see that investment in Darlington meaning that that's having an impact in Redcar. So it's just making sure that everybody feels joined up and understanding projects that resonate across the whole region and not being too which is good because of our size, but not getting too down in the weeds on what councils do, concentrate yeah. on the bigger things yeah. that impact regionally rather than the sub-regional things that only impact on a local authority. So uh, uh, we talked a little bit about some of those big things. What are, the, what are the other big things that are on either underway or you know, on your agenda for the next you know, short-term period? What, you know, what else are you... So we've been, we've been relatively reserved on this. So we obviously did a huge amount over the last couple of years. We had a fantastic budget in March with the Chancellor, which we all now dub the Teesside budget, even if it's just locally. <laughs> but it was, I mean, we've never heard a, a, sec a Secretary of State or a Chancellor ever speak in such glowing terms or be as favourable to Teesside as, as we've had in that budget, whether it be, you know, the Freeport or the Treasury or whatever it might be coming to the region. Um, and so what we're now focused on, again, going back to the point that I just made, it's great that the Chancellor announced a free port. It's great that we've announced the Treasury and DIT and others are coming to the area. It's great that we're doing all of these announcements, but I've been, I mean, it's relative. I'm always quite active on social media and in PR, but over the last four months since the election, we've just been concentrating as a team, both at the Development Corporation and at the Combined Authority. Make sure we get these things delivered. Don't go backwards from the last four years' goodwill we've built up with the public. We don't have to promise another shiny thing. We don't have to promise another massive project that's similar to the Freeport. Just deliver the Freeport. Right. Just deliver GE. Just deliver the Treasury and make sure it works. You don't have to pull up trees to please the public. You just need to be competent and deliver. And like you said, just because Rishi's made an announcement doesn't mean the next year you need another no, you know, box office yeah. announcement. Yeah. People need to feel the tangible benefits because like I say, last week's newspaper is this week's chip paper. Yeah. And that's the same in local communities. They've heard it all before. They need to see the tangible differences on the ground. So that's what we've been concentrating on. Yeah, and um, if I can be, you know, just your reflection, because you said it, so I'm just going to say what you said. But, you know, the focus on the tangible, mm -hmm. if, if, unless you were misquoted, which I don't think you were, you know, you had some something in the press earlier on about you were slightly critical of some of your mayoral colleagues, that maybe they weren't as diligent and as practical as maybe you were. I mean, just your thinking behind that? I just, I mean, if you, if you watch the podcast or read the, or listen to the podcast, I think it, there is a video of it as well. Um, you if, you listen, if you listen to the context of it, it is more <laughs> nuanced than that. But it is also fair to say that um, sometimes other, other, other mayor, mayoralities and other mayors concentrate a little bit too much on the politics rather than the delivery side. And I just made the gentle inquiry of Rob Parsons, who's a fantastic journalist, who's doing a Northern Powerhouse stuff at Reach. Um, I just made the gentle assumption that he might want to inquire of what people originally set out to do in their 17 manifesto and see actually how much progress they've made. Because it's an interesting one for devolution because it doesn't necessarily, so counter to my argument, because it's just the way I am, you know, there are other mayoralities that I personally don't think have delivered on their pledges and manifestos and done as much as they could be doing, yeah. but their vote shares have gone up. So there are other ways of being a Metro mayor actually. And one of the really powerful ways that we all saw with, with Andy Burnham, you know, all credit to him, he, he handled it extremely well, especially, what was it, like four or five days after he was elected yeah. with the Manchester bombings, yeah. bringing communities together. So sometimes it's not always about the physical. I think it is in the long term, but often it's about being a, a symbolic thing or a person or a representative that just embodies a community at the time. And you don't get that, I don't think, with normal local authorities because local authority leaders aren't high profile, nobody really knows who they are. You've, in effect, through a, a regional mayor, you have a directly elected person who has a level of gravitas that, that can speak on behalf of the public. And as long as they get the tone right in the same way that Andy got it perfectly right and responsibly with the, the Manchester attacks, that in itself can really help a, a mayor succeed yeah. in a different way to maybe that we've tackled yeah. it in, in Teesside. No, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, 
I mean, he does, he does get away with murder sometimes, though, doesn't he? Let's be honest. No, he's, you know, he's a politician. I know he does, but, I mean, oh God, he gets an I'm easy sure you ride. Chance, you, know, I'm, you know, far a bit for me to say, but, you know, you chance your arm as well, would you not? Oh, well, absolutely. You know, no, no, you're no, kind no. of making hay. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your yeah. job yeah. to no, get No, I'm get just saying he's... Oh, I'm just saying. <laughs> and I appreciate the feedback. What I'm suggesting is that, you know, you are all politicians. Oh, we're all at it. We're all politicians, aren't we? Of course we are, aren't you? Of course we are. And I must say, just to put out a concept, because I have some kind of, not from Andy, I've not spoken to Andy for a while. I, I, I've had to explain myself to people. I have a good relationship with Andy no, Burnham. And I actually, I mean, I spent early doors, I spent a lot of time with Andy and Steve Rotherham, um, neither of which I'd ever met before. Genuinely nice people yeah. on a personal level, can't fault them. Spent, you know, they're both people that you'd actually quite like to go to the pub with. Yeah. But, you know, we're always going to have disagreements. That doesn't mean we don't get on. It doesn't mean that Andy's not trying to do the best for the people of Manchester. Not. But, you know, that's politics. We do things in different ways. Indeed. Very good. Very good. Is that diplomatic enough? That is very diplomatic. Okay. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, so you, you've used the term a couple of times. We had a session actually this morning here. Andy Street was with us. Mm. And we were talking a little bit about, you know, what levelling up means. And, he, you know, he was saying, he's, you know, if you think about your agenda, his agenda... You know, that, that's levelling up before the government really coined the phrase in many respects, or at least what's required in your area is, yeah. is that. So just help us out, you know, in terms of help the government out maybe. Yep. You know, how do you interpret and make real levelling up? I mean, what does it mean for you and for the, for the Tees Valley? So I mean, notwithstanding what the government thinks, I'll ask you that in a second, but what does it mean for you and for... Yeah, I'll give you my thoughts because uh, sometimes when I, I talk about this, I can also understand that you can probably pick apart my words and maybe I contradict myself a little bit. But fundamentally, I, I get slightly irritated with people that try to define levelling up as anything because it's not anything. So people try and define it in terms of, of a cause that they're already passionate about. Yeah. And proper, proper phase one levelling up was originally about the North. I mean, we don't really talk about the Northern House anymore, yeah. do we? It's not really a phrase the government used. Boris turned it into the levelling up because actually, and this is something that I think I've mentioned to you before, and I'm sure you guys would maybe slightly disagree with, I don't know, but I actually see levelling up as more of a towns and villages and rural, semi-rural areas, not versus, but in parallel to cities. Okay. And you often find a lot of the left behind areas are non-metropolitan city areas. And that's why the government talk about levelling up because actually, as I've just been at an event, you know, some of the similar problems and poverty and deprivation we have in Teesside and the connectivity issues we have are the same in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. And you can speak to a lot of angry conservatives in the south of England who rightly say that they face similar problems as well. Um, so levelling up is, is actually a thing. Phase one, yes, it's largely based on the north of England. Um, it's, and phase one is largely infrastructure, it's physical, and it's why Boris likes levelling up, because he's an infrastructure guy, and yeah. he likes building big things. And the reason for that is if you go to, and I'll use Teesside again, but you can probably take Stoke or Bolton or parts of Sunderland and Gateshead, maybe less so Gateshead because it's doing reasonably well, but could always do with more. These are areas that have never seen any real investment for decades, from governments of both colours. And so when we talk about, and again, Andy's right to bang the drum in Manchester, because I'd be doing the same thing if I was him, but you know, asking the government for a billion quid to make a London-style transport system is for the birds in Teesside, because we're not even at the starting line for that. I mean, I've got large areas of East Cleveland that are as rural as it gets anywhere in the country who don't even have a bus. Yeah. So having that conversation with government is a non-start with us, and it's areas like that that level one of levelling up is about. It's about getting everybody to the starting line. So at least they're in with a shout. Yeah. And then phases two, you can start to nuance. And I think you nuance phase two of devolution through, uh, sorry, phase two of levelling up through devolution. Because what levelling up at that stage means to Manchester or Teesside or Newcastle or Liverpool or Leeds is different in every place. Yeah. But levelling up also on a broader scale is fundamentally about jobs and investment. Right because those things lead to the things that Michael Gove talked about, which is pride in place, better connectivity, opportunities that where you, you can still live and build a career and have a life in the area that you grew up in, yeah. rather than having to get it and go away. Yeah. All of that fundamentally comes down to more investment and more job opportunities in the regions. So I completely agree with, I might quibble with you a little bit on the cities and towns and villages. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, but yeah. I completely agree with you, irrespective of the geography question, completely agree with you on the jobs and the economy focus. Yep. Why does the government find it so hard to say that? So I'm they were party to these conversations. Why is it that they almost fall over backwards not to be explicit about the jobs and the employment? Because I think it's a bit of everything. Because I think they want to get it right. So what you're going to see in the leveling up white paper is it even it might even be the end of this month. 
Um, apparently you're on the spending review. Uh, apparently so, on. apparently it's so. Right. So in the next few weeks it's going to come. Yep. There will be metrics in the white paper. And I think that's the one thing, because it allows people to get away from what does it mean, how are we, how are we judging you on levelling up. There are going to be some metrics. And I think, to be fair, I don't know because I've not seen that level of detail. Yeah. I've just given my advice and feedback. But I think you can probably guess from what Boris has said in the last few days, yeah. you know, wage growth is a big thing. Yeah. So that's going to lead to jobs. So that's going to look at you know, average wage in the Tees Valley, 24 grand, national average 31. Yeah. You know, is there going to be a metric in there that talks about trying to get these areas up to at least the national average over a certain period of time? Mm -hmm. I think you probably will end up getting there. Would you encourage them to go down that route? You know, to be, A, as you said, focus on jobs and employment, economy-related uh, kind of focus. Secondly, to have some of those metrics that are pegging places to, you know, to something else and giving them some, you know, some target to aim for. I would like to. It'll be interesting to see on what geography they try and define those metrics or yeah. whether it's a, a UK-wide geography. I, I honestly don't know. But, I mean, ultimately, you need to set yourself some hard targets because that gives you the focus to deliver on what you're actually trying to achieve. If it's nebulous, then, you know, you can get away with anything, can't you? We're politicians, so we'll always use it to get away with anything. So the harder the metric, the better. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It'll come. But I'm pleased that they're coming up with metrics. I'm pleased that they're moving forward with um, more English devolution, looking at county deals, yeah. looking at trying to get everywhere across the country represented by um, a devolution deal. I, I think, and I've made my representations very clear to government, that I think that needs to come with a mayor. I'm still a believer in Osborne's view that if you want a devolution deal, you've got to have a mayor. Yeah. Because some in the policy units in government sometimes don't quite get the intangible thing that a mayor brings, irrespective of the personality, yeah. but the role itself comes with a standing that um, I think is more powerful than people have realised. Yeah. So I, I, county deals just to counties yeah. that just in effect give them slightly more money and more power, I think would be a big missed opportunity. Yeah, um, and I'll open up for questions uh, uh, very shortly. Um, Andy Street was saying this morning, Andy Burnham was saying it yesterday and last week, you know, they're back into government for... Devo deal three or the next, you know, a next deal. They're, at, you know, they've, mm -hmm. they've, they have their asks. Have you got? Are you in the similar space, or in a sense, are you comfortable with what you've got? And now the question is delivery for you over the next period. I mean, so it, it's interesting. It depends on what you mean by further devolution. So asks are different to devolution. Okay. So we're all, all the combined authority areas are currently having lengthy discussions about transport settlements mm -hmm. at the minute, which mm -hmm. is the thing that Andy was talking about yes. the other day for the billion quid. Um, so that's more of an ask than a, a next step in devolution, because yeah. really it's funding to be able to put in the infrastructure for transport that you want, which I think is largely the conversation. There are a couple of conversations that Andy's having, Andy Street's having around... You particularly want something on skills? He was yeah, saying, the, like, and I think with Michael Gove like in particular, I, I get the impression when I've spoken to Michael quite a lot recently, since being appointed as Secretary of State, the door seems to be much more open to further devolution of skills than it ever has been before. Right. Now, whether that materialises or not, but you can tell that... I'm just picking this up from Michael. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely something that's percolating in his mind that there is something around skills. And he's obviously, Andy Street's bent his ear about it. Um, but from our point of view, and again, it's part of the representations I've made to government on the levelling up white paper, for existing devolution deals, I think we've got to get the devolution deals we have in place right first. Now, that's not saying we shouldn't have more powers, but I think the powers that we should be asking for are about deeper powers and entrenchment of what we've already got right. that go further yeah. rather than just saying, right, I've got economic development now, so now I want health, or now I want public health, or now I want control over everything that Homes England have in my area. Yeah. I think if you broaden too quickly, you become a bloat bureaucracy, you lose focus. And the one thing that actually all combined authorities are doing relatively well is understanding the focus of the mission. Yeah. As soon as you add more diverse powers, you become a, a pseudo-local authority where you're having to fight children's services, fill in potholes, help with regeneration where you can. I, you, just, you can't do that as an organisation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So focus is what's right. Obviously, other mayors will be asking for more than that, but my view is... there. But I also think, as well, minor criticism of others, you, you take examples, they want more... You know, other mayors want more money. We all want more money. But they're more over about saying, I want more money, I want more powers, because I've not been able to do enough. But again, I, I just... It's kind of the thing that got me into trouble with the Rob Parsons <laughs> podcast was... Just go away and have a look at what they've already done with the powers and the yeah, money they've got. They and the great example of that is the Transforming Cities money. Yeah. And for those that don't know, the Transforming Cities money is, in effect, money that was allocated by the government a couple of years ago that was automatically given on a per head of population basis to combined authority areas. And obviously, depending on how big you were, you obviously got a lot more money. We got about 80 million quid because, obviously, we're the smallest area, or we were at the time. 
we are the only combined authority area that are on track to spend the money in the timescales that were agreed and set out with government. Every other combined authority area is asking for extensions from the government for the money because they're not spending the money as quickly as they should have done and as they originally intended. So, and I don't know the reasons for that. I'm sure there are some perfectly good explanations for yeah. it. But not knowing the detail, my general question was, well, maybe we should think about making sure we're spending the money that we've got first rather than continuing to ask for more when you can't even spend what you've got. Yeah. And again, there may be some legitimate reasons for that, but I think we've got to look at that very carefully before we just say, here's a load more, more money, because again, you get into that issue of expectation. Yeah, let's, yeah, say, yeah. let's say I get a billion quid, never mind Andy, you know, it's great having a billion quid, but are you using it to the effect to benefit people, yeah. or are you just going to disappoint people even further by not delivering on the outcomes that you're then able to set? Yeah, yeah, oh, very good. Uh, two more quick questions. One, uh, you touched on it already, but um, is Michael Gore good? Is that good news for the levelling up and our you know, devolution agenda? Well, I think I'm probably the last mayor to say um, that, yes, I think he is. I mean... Everybody so far has said that he's going to be good news. I mean, whatever you think of Michael, and I appreciate people outside the Conservative Party um, have certain views of him, largely from his education days and all the rest of it, but he is a reformer. Yeah. You can't deny that he was able to break the blob that was DFE. For ill, for Ill or for good, yeah. he did it. Yeah. You know, that, I think one of the things that we all looked at as mayors, irrespective of party, was we all pricked our ears up and were like, okay. Interesting. It sounds like Boris is yeah, yeah, really yeah. serious. You know, you don't put Michael in charge of that type of department unless you really want him to shake yeah. it up. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. I don't know where it's going to go, but yeah. I think there are going to be some serious changes and additions to devolution. And I don't think there are many other ministers that could do it, but Michael's definitely one of them. Okay. Last question. Maybe it's slightly unfair, but, you know, you can, <laughs> you can just ignore me, so it's fine. And I appreciate you've only just been elected second term. Third term, if you were oh, given fine. the opportunity. I, 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 get, I, get asked, I get asked no, this it's question it's every it's single time. No, <laughs> it's important to, you know, for people. I have an answer, Andrew. Good. I've, I've, right. rehearsed, you know, so I've rehearsed the answer many I'm times not the first before. I'm ask you. No. I'm sure you've got a fully versed. <laughs> but, no. you know, third term, MP, what a, you know. Yeah, I, pl I, pl I plan to stand for a third term. Right. I mean, it is, hand on heart, the best job I could ever possibly wish to have. And, and, again, and it all sounds a bit cliched and a bit sickly, but, you know, even if I don't get elected next time round, to have what will have been seven years of this has been the privilege of a lifetime. And you know, if I get re-elected again, fine. If I don't get re-elected, fine. If something happens in the meantime and I'm not able to stand, or you know, yeah. government doesn't about turn and abolishes old evolution, I'll be very happy with what I've done over the last seven years. And you're a young man, so you've got you've got plenty of time. Getting older, getting, getting, a, you? getting, getting, older getting a bit, so, bit so heavier around young, the waist. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I want, you know, it's not good for your health, this job. I can tell you that. I mean, but, you know, you're a youngish man. Anyway, right. It's very generous of you to say. I've asked my questions. Uh, I have lots more, but never left. So just put your hand up uh, if you've got a question for Ben, and I'll take a couple, and then he can answer them in the usual style that he's got. So I'll take one there, one there. So just do that one first. No, no, you go. The, the mic is right next to you, so you go. Hi. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, you mentioned about the symbolism behind the airport decision. What was the sort of the economic thinking from your point of view, for those of us not from the area, yeah. about the importance of it and, f you know, from your point of view to, like, reopen it? Okay, just hold up. For, so that's a, yeah, that's no, that's a great so question. Bring great the question. two together. The symbols so, are great, right? Yeah. If they're an economic nightmare, then you've got a, got a problem. So, the, again, I, I tried to put the context of the, the, the nature of the airport yeah. to people briefly. I mean, if you want to get in, we could probably do, we, we should do so next I year. You, I told you. They what we should do next there. year, Andrew, is just do a session on the airport. airport. It's okay, as long as you're because, uh, uh, do it. more than happy to do it. So, there we go. so when, uh, the other thing that we knew we had to do was not just say we're going to save the airport. We had to set out a rationale for it. And actually, there were two reasons for that. One, actually, I believe, you know, if you're going to do something that is actually quite radical at the time to do, but also, secondly, I had five Labour local authorities I had to convince that the combined authority to sign off the deal. They were never going to sign it off unless there was an economic rationale. And again, if we're being completely blunt, they were always going to look for an excuse not to sign it off. So that had to be a sound economic case. So we set out uh, spending a lot of time with our team looking at, well, what is the case for the airport? Well, we knew the principles of it, but we had to develop the business case for it. And let's also not forget, as combined authority areas, we have to report back annually to MHCLG, or whatever we call it, Dulu now, or whatever we're calling it, um, and into Treasury because of the assurance frameworks we've got. So we're pegged against economic outcomes. So if I go and waste, as the Labour Party would say, 40 million quid on an airport, then that's going to reflect in our review to government. And in theory... If we don't meet our benchmarks, they can pull the devolution deal because we're not performing. So it's not just local pride. It's not like justifying it to the public. It's not just by local politicians. You've also got to justify it to the government. Now, 
as the airport stood, when it was literally about to close before we bought it, we had one flight, well, sorry, we had one service to Schiphol, one service to Aberdeen, three flights a day to Schiphol. That was it, those two routes. Um, the airport supports, and all of this is, as I continue to say to people who complain about the airport, the business case is online. You can go on my website. We published it before we bought the airport to justify, to say, look, you can see what we're going to do. We can see what the plan is. The airport, as it stood when we bought it, was worth uh, 85 million pounds a year in GVA to the Tees Valley economy, losing two million pounds a year. And it supported, um, I'm going to forget this number, I think it supported at the time directly and indirectly 400 jobs. So the baseline was, even if it does as badly as it does now forever, we're, we're safeguarding 400 jobs and there's GVA, so there's wider economic benefit to the region of having that international connectivity, especially the link to Schiphol, which was allowing both inward investment and local connectivity for businesses to the rest of the world. Then we developed three business cases for what we want to achieve. One was the baseline, which was nothing changes. So that was the 10 year plan. If nothing changes, the money we've set aside for the airport will last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So even if we only have these two flights, we don't see an increase in passenger numbers, then we've got 10 years of this airport. And we made the argument, although it was a weaker one than the other two business cases, that even if it did that, it's arguably worthwhile for the GVA impact and the job impact to keep it going for that 10 year period. Then there was what was a relatively low baseline, which was we, we badged as the middle way, which was getting the airport up to about 500, just over 500,000 passengers, which would see the airport losses come down to approximately 400,000 pounds per annum. And you saw a jump in GVA, can't remember what the number was now, I think it jumped up to like 120 million or something. Um, and there were more obviously direct jobs and indirect jobs that were supported because of that. Again, I, apologies, it was four years ago, I can't remember the number of that, that, what it was. And then there was the argument that, and funnily enough, the business case did show this, that at that level where you were subsidizing an airport to the tune of half a million pounds a year, it was the most economically impactful thing that the combined authority could invest in compared to anything else right. we've ever invested in because of the multiplier effect of having that connectivity in that regional airport. Yep. I mean, connectivity hubs, ports and airports from a multiplier effect are disproportionately beneficial to areas, regions, city centers, whatever it might be. So that was the middle way. And then the top way was, you know, if all goes well, we're gonna get 1.4 million passengers in 10 years, GBA is gonna go through the roof, it's gonna support a lot of jobs, and the airport was gonna start making money in year, back end of year six, beginning of year seven. I think it was like quarter four of year six. Um, and so we said to people, look, these are the options. You've got the baseline, it's gonna cost you this. Middle way, which is, easy, is, is comfortably achievable, is this, but even if it goes wrong, you've got the bottom one. And actually, as a push case, we've got this, and that includes us needing to land a low cost carrier. It means that we're gonna to have to have 10 additional routes to the airport over the next 10 years. We set out that level of detail. Now, I would say, actually, we've, we've, we've massively exceeded that, even with COVID. So we landed Ryanair as a low cost carrier. Uh, Touchwood, we're about to announce another airline coming in. We've already got 16 new routes to the airport. Um, we're, and, and the other thing for the business case that was really important for us to do, because again, particularly for the labor leaders, we wanted to manage this, was that the whole business case was just predicated on passenger numbers. So the only way the airport can make money is getting passengers through the airport and spending money in the airport, because that's all an airport is. It's just a terminal to put people on flights. Yeah. Can you get them spending money in the shop or in the bars, et cetera, et cetera. What we've now done, and we did it four weeks ago, I think it was, Jason, wasn't it? Um, we have updated the business plan, and what we've now done, because we've had nearly two years at it, is we've included other parts. So we're about to set up, a, well, we're in the process of setting up a cargo terminal and a regulated agent that comes operational in November. So there's a huge opportunity for additional cargo, especially because of the capacity of slots we have at Teesside, which uh, helps... Uh, cargo being more flexible coming in and out of the country. It also means that the cargo planes can spend longer on the tarmac, which means they don't have to process it as quickly. So it's much more cost effective and amenable to cargo to come through places like Teesside. And the other thing that we've now included in the business plan that wasn't included was the property development of the 400 acres of land that came with purchasing the airport. And we're going to start building 400,000 square feet of logistics and shed space in March. So as soon as you add those numbers in, which we've done, and we've been still relatively pessimistic about the airport business case, that airport will make money within three years. So that means we're actually two years ahead of schedule from the original seven years coming down to five, and that's even with the pandemic. Yeah. Now, just to say, the airport did lose 10 million pounds because of the pandemic, because it closed for six months. But the other benefit that you see in the street on that is 
Well, had COVID come, well, the airport would have closed anyway. But even if you believe the alternative argument that the airport was never going to close, I guarantee it would have closed during COVID because there's no private provider that would have ever subsidized it to that element yeah. to allow it to work through. So the business plan is strong. But ultimately, the backstop that I've been very clear to the public on, and I think it's right to do this, is this is all the money the airport's got. So if it doesn't work, it was a bit of a, and we said this at the time when we bought it, this is last, last chance saloon. Yeah. It might not work, but I think it's worth giving it a shot. And I think we'll see in the future, depending on what happens with the airport, hopefully it will never come to this. But I think if the airport was to fail, certainly under my tenure, if it was to fail and there was no more money and we tried it and it just didn't work, then I'm confident that you know, we would have to say that you know, we're going to have to call it a day. But I honestly don't think we're going to get that. Okay, very good. That's a long-winded answer, but it's worth putting That's a fair answer. We should definitely do a session on airports, I feel. Well, you can, should. Can come, well, if what, you look at Manchester, well, we're recording this, you know, so Manchester yeah, yeah, no, lost 350 million quid, yeah, yeah, Newcastle yeah. have lost yeah. 100 million yeah. quid, Luton Airport, I mean, what was it, Heathrow, 2 billion? Yeah. I mean, aviation is probably yeah, the worst industry It's in a bit of trouble, yeah, yeah. At the time we bought that airport. Exactly, it was a great timing, I'm sure, to how you thought about it. Victoria, question from you. Thank you. I have got a little airport question as well, which I think should be mandatory Don't for the session. Don't encourage you, No, I love airports, airport, so yeah, sorry, it will come in, but very simply, um, levelling up white paper is due later this month now, I guess we're in October. Um, putting aside money um, with the CSR, what's your number one sort of uh, ask that you would like to see in that white paper? That was the first question, because I'm not sure I picked that up, but yeah. maybe I missed it. Um, and yes, I will indulge you in an airport question because I, I like um, airports. Have, uh, having worked for Boris at the time in City Hall when we, people got very excited about, um, what do we call it, Boris Island Ooh. and airports. And, you know, people do get excited about airports. Um, whether we like it or not, it gets the conversation going. Um, do you think that the airport deal that you've been able to do would have happened if there hadn't been an elected mayor? Ooh, let me add one word into no, that question. On. An elected Conservative mayor. I didn't ask that. I know you didn't I ask think that. that. No, no listen, that. hang on a moment, Andrew. No, I think no, this no, is beyond... An it's just an extra word. I think it's beyond politics. I think it's beyond no, no. politics, but anyway. Well, that's that's so, I mean, the, there are lots of different questions. Do the first one first. Leveling up first. No, it's, it's easier to ask it than to the airport okay, question. Okay, I think the other question is more, in, you know, more detailed. All right. So, no, nobody. The, the, if there wasn't a mayor, the airport wouldn't have been bought and it would have closed. And to be fair, Peel were already on a... Uh, I appreciate my, they're also a Manchester bit of business. Yeah, I yeah. do like Manchester. This is no, not no, of course, no, it's just, just, ha it ha just happens to it. No, 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 no. But they, uh, they were on a path to closing down the airport. They'd applied for planning to build 350 houses on it. They were wanting to turn it into a, a housing estate. And they never, I mean, if they're truthful, and I've spoken to them a few times, they never really wanted Teesside Airport. Their focus was very much on Doncaster Sheffield. And they could see, as they are developers, that there was a big real estate development opportunity for Teesside Airport. So, no, absolutely, it would, it would never have been bought and saved, and it would have been closed a couple of years ago. Under a Conservative mayor, no, I don't think it would, because when I stood in 2017, and I sat down, you know, the CCHQ bods come up, well done, Ben, you've been selected. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're going to try and help you win the election. What are you going to do? I'm not entirely sure how you're going to help me, but that's fine. Yeah. What are your election pledges? Airport. You well, <laughs> I've got this idea. Are you mad? <laughs> I'm going to buy Teesside Airport. <laughs> yeah. And these two guys I sat across the table well. from me were like, <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> and so we had a bit of a chat about it and went away. And, you know, the feedback, I mean, the honest feedback was, I got a phone call from the, one of the guys that sat in front of me and said, um, look, Ben, appreciate what you're trying to do. Get what you're trying to do. Get why you're doing it for Teesside. But... If you're going to do that, and this is going to be one of your policy announcements, unfortunately, we won't be able to support you during the election. Okay. So, if it had, again, so you had the Conservative mayor, and I, I don't think it would have done. Yeah. Unless maybe James Walton had convinced another Conservative candidate to <laughs> make it their pledge. Yeah, yeah, well. quite. Um, so, no, I, I don't think it would. Um, okay. On the levelling up point, it's a bit of a niche one, but I actually think there's some really interesting stuff we should be doing around FDI and the Department of International Trade because DIT do still, uh, I mean, actually, they're quite good. The Office for Investment that's been set up in Number 10 is a lot better at this uh, than DIT generally, because it sits within Number 10 and it sits across Bayes and DIT. Um, but DIT could be much better at sharing with us and working jointly with us as the region for big foreign direct investment inquiries that they get. Absolutely. Oh, always happy to speak well, to investors. Look at this, brilliant. It's oh, to investors to speak to you, exactly. There we go. Yeah, yeah, well, and we also know that you know Neil is 
is in favour of FDI as a, as a vehicle for thinking about how you kind of turn yeah. different places around historically. We've and it is important because you that. often find the centre try and manage it internally, like the centre always does, doesn't want to give much away. I mean, there was one, and I was never told, but a couple of years ago, uh, we got an inquiry from number 10, the Office for Investment, saying we've got a big automotive manufacturer who wants to come to the UK, they're thinking about it, we're looking to put forward sites, have you got anything in the Tees Valley that would work? You've got 48 hours, we can't tell you who it is, pull a proposal together. And we did, we, did our, we put our best foot forward as much as we could on that. But you kind of think we probably didn't do that justice because you could have tailored it to the type of manufacturer. You know, if we'd have known a bit more about them and actually been able to get in front of them. All, we you can't tell you who it is. And also in 48 For hours, I mean, you know, the, they were saying the manufacturers are being quite confidential about it. So I can get that. You kind of feel like with devolution, it's great. And there are parts of government that really buy into it. And by government, I mean the civil service. There are parts that don't. And with devolution, it's one thing having devolution, more devolution, both new deals and existing deals. But one of the things that I think needs to change in some of the departments, in the nicest possible way, is, is a more mutual respect for what we can do for each other. Mm -hmm. And it often feels like they'll give us a bit if they think it can help. But sometimes, actually the majority of the time, they don't necessarily think that devolved areas can help them. And we've got a lot of solutions that could help government, especially around net zero, that you sometimes just think, the view of civil servants is, well, if it hasn't come from us, it's not really yeah, worth not thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, definitely, we definitely think. So a gentleman there, uh, Zoe there, a gentleman there. So just start there at the far end. Yeah, just uh, do me a favour and just speak into the mic, mic if you would. I think it's for the recording. It's for the recording, um, uh, so we get, get your questions. Oh, right. I hope this is so, COVID-friendly. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Bear that in mind. <laughs> Dr. Andy Mycock. I'm... Uh, lecturer at University of Huddersfield. Um, it's interesting you didn't mention there's been some uh, centres for the cities report for about three months ago that suggested that the cost of rebalancing the north-south divide and levelling up the country would cost about two trillion pounds. It was something on the scale of the challenge facing East and West Germany. Mm -hmm. and if we look 30 years down the line, East and West Germany still haven't levelled up and the predictions are it's probably another 30 years before you get anywhere near it in terms of overall outcomes, in terms of health, life, expectancy, etc. Um, and I think the report did say something on the lines that um, the current government approach was a lot of warm words about places and free ports. Um, and it charted back and said you need to go back to the 1930s to actually look at when this north-south divide starts to evolve. Yep. Um, and the solution was, the suggestion was, is that there needed to be some kind of adoption of a solidarity tax, that there needed to be some approach to seriously taking this. Government isn't taking the levelling up agenda significantly in terms of pace, in terms of scale, uh, and in terms of money, which is something you say isn't important. And I just wonder whether you do have any thoughts on the idea that this is such a challenge, it's going to take so much time and investment, that government needs to think about a levelling up tax to genuinely address the issue. Very good. Okay, it's a good question. Uh, just to, a good I question. mean, I could answer, you know, on our behalf and some of the things that you... Why don't you do that? No, 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 because it's in conversation with you, not with We're me. We're in conversation, no, no, no. though. Yeah, but conversation. I'm not in conversation with him. You're in conversation <laughs> with him now. You and I are done. So let's get, let's get the question there. And then we can come back. And we, uh, where was it? Yeah, there's a gentleman right at the far end. Zoe. Hi there. Thank you. And thanks very much, uh, Ben, for your great discussion. Um, my name's Zoe Billingham. I'm head of policy at the Centre for Progressive Policy. And we also run the Inclusive Growth Network with a bunch of metro mayors and council leaders. Um, my question was about your relationship with the other metro mayors. Um, obviously, at the last um, local election, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and West of England somewhat surprisingly went over to Labour, which somewhat tips the balance in terms of the number of metro mayors who are conservative um, versus the Labour cohort. So I just wondered whether, kind of since then or otherwise, what your relationship is like with the, the kind of M9 group of metro mayors. Is, is it kind of collaboration, coordination or competition? Very good. Wait, wait, good wait, wait. Good question. Oh. Gentlemen there. We'll take the three and then we'll... Hiya, thanks Ben and um, thanks to the organisers as well. Um, I've got a slightly annoying um, political, ideological question. Very good. Um, Teesside's often spoken about as a sort of laboratory of a sort of new Toryism. 
described your difficulties at the beginning of your um, mayorship when the Labour Party were opposed to taking the airport into public ownership. Um, and you, of course, supported that. You've spoken out in favour of public investments in green jobs, not just any green jobs, manufacturing jobs, um, and reshoring manufacturing at a time when, well, I guess when you were growing up and I was growing up, manufacturing was leaving the country at a rate of knots and your area at a rate of knots under a conservative government. Um, and you criticised the Notting Hill set, 2010 vintage and austerity. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, I'm not saying you're a... Um, anti-free market. I know you have a, um, a background in business, but is there something new going on here? Is there a new sort of shift in ideological sand? Um, and, and where do you think this politics comes from, if it exists at all? Very good. Uh, so we've got three questions, right? big question. I mean, essentially, there? essentially his question was, isn't le leveling up, isn't it long term very expensive yeah. and not easy? No, it is. It is. Mean, which is Again, true, right? is, and, uh, and to be fair, every event I've done on leveling up, at the conference so far, and it's a stat that I think I don't. Did you come up with it? No. Um, the two I know trillion. Because I first no. The, the, I first heard Kevin Hollenrake say in Parliament, who's the MP for Thurscombe Moulton, stood up and said that the relative difference between the north and the south divide in GDP terms is relatively uh, relative to the same when uh, East and West Germany, the fall of the Berlin Wall, which it just does actually set out how stark the work that needs to be done is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's why you've got to have sensible grown-up politics about this. About It's going to take, well, you, know, you, you make an interesting assumption. I haven't read the detail of the paper, but if it's 30 years, that wouldn't surprise me. I think maybe, you know, at least 20 years it's going to take for us to get anywhere near bridging some of those divides. But those, that's the type of level of investment that we need. Now, all of that investment doesn't have to be public sector investment. You look at, I, know, I think there was a reference to somebody talking about free ports. Um, you know, free ports are other smart regulatory mechanisms to be able to lower the cost barrier and the risk barrier for the private sector investors to come in. I mean, it is the single, I mean, speak to Kwasi Kwarteng, speak to the government. I negotiated the heads of terms with GE to build their offshore in Blade Factory in Teesside. It said in big red letters across the heads of terms, we will only come if you get a free port in the budget because it was going to save, I can't say the number, but it was going to save them a lot of money, which made the difference between them extending their facility in Cherbourg or coming to Teesside. Now, the reason that's important, yes, it's great building a big shed that's going to cost, you know, a quarter of a billion quid or whatever it's going to cost, but it's actually about the fact that it's going to create 2,000 jobs. In Teesside, 39% of people have a level three qualification or above. It's not great. Actually, no, it's 29%, sorry, not 39%. It's pretty terrible. Yeah. yeah. 74% of the 2,000 jobs that GE are going to create are level three and above. So you're already into that mechanism of life opportunities. You get into some really interesting stuff here about, again, appreciate it, I'm going to answer the question on tax as well, but you get into stuff like you've got to have something on your doorstep. It talks about the decline in manufacturing. I mean, you can speak to, you know, my dad used to work in the dockyards. I've got family that used to work in the steelworks, friends and family that used to work in ICI. You know, you used to walk out of school at 16 without a qualification and you'd walk into British Steel, you'd sit in front of the union rep, you'd sit in front of the interviewer, and they'd say, where's your dad work? Well, he works here in British Steel. Great, well, you've got a You're job, in. come and work. Yep. Or you'd sit in front and say, well, actually, he works for ICI, and they'd say, why are you here? Go to ICI, and you'd walk along to ICI and get a job. And that's what used to happen. And you also had this quite paternalistic view from these large employers who also had the balance sheets to be able to put on buses from the local schools, put on all of that outreach, encourage them to say, come into this industry. Whereas with the change of the economy into a much more kind of gig economy, much more diverse economy, in places like Teesside that no longer has those major employers that are employing tens of thousands of people, the resources for those small employers aren't there to be as paternalistic anymore. So we are trying to do a bit of a balance. Take the Teesworks site, for instance, you've got 14 million square feet. The 2,000 jobs that GE brings on is on 80 acres. We've got 4,500 acres. It's only less than a million square feet that they're building. So we've got another 13 GEs to bring. So you can multiply that up. There's 2,000 jobs. I mean, that's a lot of jobs that's going to come. The biggest problem we have in Teesside now is that we're going to create, hand on heart, we will be creating thousands of jobs over the next three to five years, starting literally in four weeks' time. The biggest problem we're going to have is making sure that local people have the skills and the opportunity to get those jobs. Because mm -hmm. you get into a really interesting dynamic of breakdown of communities that feel locked out of opportunities that are on their doorstep. Yeah. But if they can see those opportunities, you also get huge impacts on educational outcomes as well. If you can see at 7, 8, 9, 10, you can see when you look out your door, offshore wind construction going on, you can see factories, you can see physical things happening that create prosperity. It raises aspiration. It gives young people something to look forward to. So I think all of that comes together in a much bigger conversation that we all know isn't going to change the human nature and the economy and our communities over the next two, three years until the general election. What we need is a start that 
hopefully builds up credibility that means levelling up in 10 years' time, irrespective of who's in government, is baked in, and we're on that journey over a 20 or 30 year period. To try and promise jam tomorrow where levelling up's going to be done in 10 years' time, I think is foolish by any party that wishes to do that. Yeah. On a levelling up tax, I don't think that's the right way to go. I do think, interestingly enough, as part of the devolution conversation is, and, and I know that the Prime Minister is, is on this same page, is we're also very fortunate as Metro Mayors to have money and to have a level of power, and we can all dispute whether it's enough money or enough power, but we also have a limited amount of responsibility. And with further devolution of existing deals and new deals, I think it also needs to be balanced with more responsibility. And I think that responsibility can come through the taxation system. Okay. You know, if, you, if you're going to, like my airport <coughs> argument, you know, if you want to build a London style transport system in Manchester, go out and sell it to the public. And part of that is going to be raising a transport levy or a tax to be able to fund yeah, it. Yeah. You can't then, because I can see what's going to come down the road. And I, I could be wrong, but maybe I would do it if I was him. I'm going to ask for a billion quid for a London style transport system. The government are going to end up giving me, I don't know how much, less than that. And I'm going to complain that it's not my fault. The government didn't give me enough, so therefore I can't do what I want to do. And it's this idea, and again, I, I, again, it's really not an attack on Andy. It's just this example that it's very easy for Metro Mayors at the minute to just blame the centre that it's not enough power and not enough money. Hmm. And the rebalancing of devolution does also need to be in the responsibility sense, potentially through a level of taxation. I think, I think it would be interesting to see what the business rate review comes out as, because yes. I think the business rates could be a really relatively straightforward one to be able to devolve to Metro Mayors and start to see some interesting competition between areas. So I, I think it's a start, it's probably not a complete answer, but that, that's, no, that's a good I'm answer, that's a good answer. On, on, the, on dealing with other Metro other Mayors, Metro I mean, you love I, have, them, right? I have a level, no, I do have a level, I like all of the Metro Mayors. I mean, I don't know some of the newer ones. Um, so obviously the, the people that replaced James Palmer and um, Tim in, in the West of England, I, I mean, apologies, I'm not even familiar with their names. In COVID, it's difficult for us to get together. We've had a couple of calls uh, with each other and, and obviously with Michael Gove last week when yep. we first had our meeting as the new Secretary of State. I, 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 have, I sometimes struggle with the M10 stuff because it's kind of the antithesis of devolution because if devolution is devolution, there can't be a homogenous blob of mayors all asking for the same thing. Because, again, what's important in West, West Yorkshire or Cambridgeshire is not what's important in Teesside. So I, I find it odd that we can coalesce around something that we all want. That doesn't really make much sense to me. However, I do find it interesting that sometimes there is a forum that people can get together and sometimes share best practice um, about how our, our organisations work. So I'm, I question how effectual it is because devolution shouldn't be about bring, coming together and coming up with single ideas. I mean, the north of England is a different place. Never mind trying to bring Sadiq in London together with Andy and me and mm. the west of England. It yeah. doesn't quite work, does it? Um, but we work together where we need to and where we can. And, you know, there is now a large Labour caucus that, that do collaborate quite heavily. Um, there have been a number of announcements in, in the north of England where the mayors have all come out and said something that I wasn't even invited to, to, to put my name to. So, again, that's, that was part of the point I was making the yep. other day as well. Yep. There is more politics as a result creeping into this, especially as the government pushed the levelling up agenda as their number one agenda. You know, you're going to expect that in politics, aren't you? So, you know, I... I so the honest answer is I don't engage very much. I engage where I think it benefits Teesside, and I find it odd that we can have a one-size-fits-all for mayors across the M10. OK, very good. We're, uh, I take the last question. Yeah. Are, we, are you inventing a new style of politics, a new, new Toryism, Red Tory? I mean, are you ahead of where the Conservative so I don't know, I, I, Party's I, I, I trying don't know to get to? I don't know what you're like. We, I mean, I'm probably going to offend you here, but I feel like we're probably not far off similar ages, maybe, or similar generations. Um, but <laughs> Don't take offence. I mean, I would say I'm not... So, again, to give you a bit of background on my kind of political beliefs, I'm not a child of Thatcher. I mean, I was born in 1986, so I, I don't remember the Thatcher years. I mean, what was that when she left, like, six or seven when she left office or whatever it was? Um, you know, my first memory of politics full stop was the general election day in 97, and I remember, for whatever reason, the image that sticks in my head is that one of Tony Blair and Diane Abbott and someone else on, down by the Thames on the, the early hours the next morning. Oh, I, was, okay, yeah, I was 11 yeah. at the time. And I only remember it because I remember it appearing on the telly and my parents aren't political either. So I didn't come from a political family and never have done. Um, and I remember them talking about politics and they never talked about politics. And they weren't talking about it as in like, oh, the Labour are terrible and why didn't the Tories win or vice versa. They just talked about it in a way that as an 11, well, 10 year old actually, um, something big had happened. 
and it kind of captured my imagination to, to get interested in politics. Now, my personality I know, and it's something I always need to check myself with, I'm a slight, well, I'm, I'm an optimist, and some people say I'm overly optimistic, and also, I'm also a contrarian. So when I grew up going into secondary school in 1998, growing up with five Labour councils that have been wall-to-wall Labour for 50 years, you know, what, we didn't have a single Tory MP, I don't think, in 97 in, in Teesside. We've only ever held one seat up until 2019. So it was wall-to-wall Labour MPs. We had Tony Blair in Sedgefield. You had Mo Molham. You had all of these big hitters running the government with wall-to-wall Labour councils. And I just thought, as I was getting interested in politics, the simplistic nature of it was Teesside didn't feel any positive boom from the Labour years. And Labour councils were always able to blame Thatcher because they had a Conservative government but in the 2000s, they had no one else to blame. And it was, it, to some extent, my early development in politics where I kind of thought I'm probably a conservative was 14, 15, where I just thought there must be a better way of doing this because I see wall-to-wall Labour. There's nobody else to blame. And we've had 13 years of this, and I don't see any improvements for places like Teesside. Now, you can argue whether that was different elsewhere. So I kind of went down that route. But I'm not... I'm not I, I try and pride myself, and I don't always get this right, but I pride myself on outcomes. And so people find it really difficult to pigeonhole me because, like I say, I nationalised an airport. Well, I, that's exactly what I did. Public body bought an airport. But I also came up with and developed, with Rishi Sunak, the most free market policy that this government have come up with, with free ports. Because it's about outcomes for people. And this idea that people... I mean, I got it. Was it Will Hutton that called Houchinism? I was like, the absolute drivel that various journalists wrote about me after the election. It's just like... And the reason, and where I do get slightly, not ideological, but academic about it, is I, I do find Milton Friedman a very interesting man, and I listen and read a lot of his stuff. And one thing that helps centre me sometimes about the left and right and about the mechanisms of the public sector or whatever it might be, or government, is that Milton Friedman said, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically said, there is actually no fundamental difference between the public and private sector. They're all run by people. They're all run by people who run organisations. The difference is the mechanism of death of a... Um, of a programme or a project or a business that is owned. There is a natural mechanism in the private sector that is profit-driven that ultimately means if it's not efficient, not profitable, therefore it will die and it might get bought, it might be made more efficient, but there is an end to it. In the public sector, in effect, you get subsidised programmes that forever get subsidised and a new programme just appears. And I try and take that view that actually my organisation is run by people. Those people could be in the private sector just as effectively and doing just as well as they are in the combined authority. And that's why I come back to the airport point is, as long as you are strong enough to be able to pull the plug in the public sector and say, you know what, enough is enough, and you allow programmes or projects or schemes to die when they should die, then actually the public sector can be very powerful. And I'm a big believer that, you know, in the right way, the public sector can set that framework and does have a role in being able to unleash the innovation, the energy, and the motivation that the private sector brings to it. So uh, whether that's traditional Tory, whether it's slightly social democrat, I don't know what it is. But Hochinism. That's, but that's what I am. It's Hochinism. I, I honestly don't know what it is. <laughs> no, no, fair enough. Uh, look, we could really could go on, uh, but we can't, unfortunately. But Ben, thank you very much for spending some no, time pleasure. with us. And I really appreciate your openness with the questions as well, both on the you know, on the personal, your motivations, what drives you, but also some of the questions in relation to, you know, other mayors, which I appreciate, you know, sensitive, and we have to handle those things carefully, but I really appreciate it. I don't think I said anything okay. too You didn't say anything, at no, you didn't. I don't think so. No, no, but you could have said, I'm not prepared to answer or engage in any of those conversations, oh, you know, right, that okay. sort of area, and you didn't do that at all, so I deeply uh, no, appreciate pleasure. that as well. Thank so you. please join me to thank uh, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if you haven't quite had enough of mayors, in less than an hour in this very room, Ben will be here, obviously. We're going to have a chat with Andy Burnham about what's going on in Greater Manchester. <laughs> You're welcome to stay.